In the Old Testament, the book of 1 Samuel and the book of preceding that, Judges, shows a changeover from the way in which the people of Israel were governed and led and to a different way of having a king and working with this new ruler. And we're living in a world which is in turmoil. Different things are happening. Different ways are being um, tied out in government, in uh, connections between different uh, countries and the way in which there are revolts to overthrow governments and so on. So it might be, we're hoping it might be, uh, a useful area of the Old Testament to have a look at some of the pitfalls and some of the good things that uh, happened. Previous to our reading, previous to the book of uh, 1 Samuel, the leadership of the um, country, the, the nation, was by judges who uh, didn't have any re uh, regal, didn't want, want uh, royalty, but in their wisdom and guidance, they hoped to control and to guide the nation. Uh, but came a time when this, they moved on. You might say they moved back in some ways, but they moved to a king in control. And the first king was Saul, and we'll learn a little about him this evening, I hope. So 1 Samuel chapter 10, and uh, we're going to read, as I say, the first 11 verses. Then Samuel, one of the judges, the chief judge, then Samuel took a flask of oil and poured it on Saul's head, and kissed him, saying, Has not the Lord anointed you leader over his inheritance? When you leave me today, you'll meet two men near Rachel's tomb, at Zeltah, on the border of Benjamin. They will say to you, The donkeys you set out to look for have been found, and now your father has stopped thinking about them and is worried about you. He is asking, what shall I do about my son? Then you will go on from there until you reach the great tree of Tabor. Three men going up to God at Bethel will meet you there. One will be carrying three young goats, another three loaves of bread, and another a skin of wine. They will greet you and offer you two loaves of bread, which you will accept from them. After that, you will go to Gilba of God, where there is a Philistine outpost. As you approach the town, you will meet a procession of prophets coming down from the high place with lyres, tambourines, flutes and harps being played before them, and they will be prophesying. The Spirit of the Lord will come upon you in power and you will prophesy with them and you'll be changed into a different person. Once these signs are fulfilled, do whatever your hand finds to do, for God is with you. Go down ahead of me to Gilgal. I will surely come down to you to sacrifice burnt offerings and fellowship offerings. But you must wait seven days until I come to you and tell you what you are to do. As Saul turned to leave Samuel, God changed Saul's heart, and all these signs were fulfilled that day. When they arrived at Gilba, a procession of prophets met him. The Spirit of God came down upon him in power, and he joined their prophecy, sighing. When all those who had formerly known him saw him prophesying with the prophets, they asked each other, What is this that has happened to the son of Gish? Is Saul also among the prophets? We'll perhaps find out what happened. Was Saul really among the prophets? 
And here the unknown writer of Hebrews is remember, um, referring back to the Old Testament and refreshing the memory of his readers to think about the way in which God worked through the people of old and brought in his kingdom in many in in the uh, in Israel um, we can look back perhaps at our own nation and think one day back there that time back there there was more knowledge of God than there is nowadays but it's the same God it may be our own not un, our own um, weak understanding that uh, misses the great word of, of Jesus Christ. At any rate, in Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 32, he's been speaking about, he's been speaking about uh, some of the Old Testament heroes. And he goes on in verse 32. And what more shall I say? I do not have time to tell about Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel and the prophets, who through faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice and gained what was promised, who shut the mouth of I mouths of lions, quenched the fury of the flames and escaped the edge of the sword, whose weakness was turned to strength and who became powerful in battle and routed foreign armies. Women received back their dead, raised to life again. Others were tortured and refused to be released so that they might gain a better resurrection. Some faced jeers and flogging, while still others were chained and put in prison. They were stoned. They were sawn in two. They were put to death by the sword. They went about in sheepskins and goatskins, destitute, persecuted, and ill-treated. The world was not worthy of them. They wandered in deserts and mountains, and in caves and holes in the ground. They were all commended for their faith, yet none of them received what had been promised. God had planned something better for us, so that only together with us would they be made perfect. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinful men, so that you might not grow weary and lose heart. God blesses the reading of his word. I want this evening to look at a change of government. We've had a change of government in our own country, a possible change of government coming up in the United States, and other countries where perhaps changing the government has not been so peaceful, but has been a matter of struggle and overcoming the problems. So we're looking at, for the people of Israel, they wanted a new ruler. They had these judges who looked after the use of the laws of God, but they didn't seem to have the power behind them. They were more administrators. They wanted a new 
leader, a new king. They wanted a new role for such people. So let us have a look at some of the things that went on. It's a difficult and a complicated situation, so uh, hold tight for a bumpy ride. For many of the people, the life and style of living of people in the news is a topic they love to hear about and discuss. The red top um, papers, newspapers, are full about people and what they're up to and sometimes what they shouldn't be up to. But very few of us have read, uh, sorry, have met such people that uh, there's written about, especially on the one-to-one -one situation. They seek, the people who read, to know about their secrets, know what was the last, latest gossip about them. They want a glimpse into their lives. My, my, friend, my wife has a friend who worked for royalty. And when you're close to royalty like that, you are discreet. No secrets should be released. There are those who like to tell it like it is. The Bible is honest and clear about the lives of those it describes. And about us who read it. I want to look today at one of those described, the enigmatic character of Israel's first king. The transition that took place from the judges to a king, one who had much stronger power there over the country. So Israel had settled down in the land which was given them by God under the leadership of one of the final judges, the final judge, Joshua, and following him, various other judges, people like Gideon and Samson and Samuel and Eli, Judges, not so much about working in the courts, but as leaders leading a military force, dealing with foreign foes. They were surrounded by enemies. Too quickly, however, the judges were involved in battles with surrounding enemies and were not relying on the Lord. The people were not satisfied without nice domestic leaders who did not follow God's ways, who went their own particular way. Joshua himself has set his eyes upon the Lord as a pattern to deal with the country, to leave the country. The new leaders had not, did not have that care. And so God stepped in. The angel of the Lord, we read, went up from Gilgal to Bochim and said, I brought you out of Egypt and led you into a land which I swore to give to your ancestors. I said, I will never break my covenant with you. You shall not make a covenant with the people of this land, but you shall break down their altars. Yet you've disobeyed me. Why have you done this? I've also said I will not drive them out before you. They will become traps for you and their gods will become snares to you. When the angel of the Lord has spoken these things to all the Israelites, the people wept aloud and they called this place Bokim. They offered sacrifices to the Lord. Joshua had told them what it was that was wrong with them. 
They thought they knew it all, but they were basing their lives on their own ideas, not on the ideas of God, which the prophets had been bringing them. So when the angel of the Lord has spoken these things to all the Israelites, the people wept. After Joshua had dismissed the Israelites, they went to take possession of the land, each to their own inheritance. The people served the Lord throughout the lifetime of Joshua and of the elders who outlived him and had seen the great things the Lord had done for Israel. Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died at the age of 110, and they buried him in the land of his inheritance, in the hill country of Ephraim, north of Mount Gash. And over the years, others became leaders. A few looked to the Lord. Leaders, good, bad, indifferent. Some names are well known to us, others perhaps more obscure. There was Deborah, the woman leader. There was Gideon, who at home and in across the state cleared, at least temporarily, the land from the land of the land of Baal worship places and fought the invading Midianites. There was Jephthah, the warrior who made a stupid promise about sacrificing the first who came to greet him, not realising it was going to be one of his own family. Samson, full of the strength of body, but so weak in his relationship with Delilah. By the end of the book of Judges, law was falling apart. We haven't time to read through, but if you read the last couple of chapters of the book of Judges, you'll see how such errors were widespread. Sexually, violence, anything went. And by chapter 20, the whole state is falling apart with civil war, atrocities, kidnap, all sorts of things happening. So I want to look at how Samuel came in and tried to revive things. We read in chapter 21 about the birth of Samuel. You may remember that his mother, Hannah, wanted a child. Her tears were misunderstood by the local priest as the fact that she was drunk. It was just an indication of what the world was like in those days, that it was more likely someone was crying for drunkenness than for sorrow. So Samuel was born at the last of a number of judges who led the Israelites, not, as I said before, one who sat in a courtroom, but who sought to lead the people in the right directions, making the right decisions. God sent us the right people at the right time. When we're in dark times, may he send us ones who can lead us in the right direction. More years later came another more looked for, another who would bring peace, not just to the land of Israel, but all who, to all who recognise him as God himself, the man of peace. In Samuel's time, the Lord would work to pull the land back from total chaos. 2,000 years, God came into the world to declare that he came as a, 
uh, 2,000 years ago, God came into this world to indicate, to declare that he came as saviour and redeemer. How many of the people in this world are followers of Jesus Christ? What do we need to pray for in our day? We've only got to look round at the world as it is at the moment to open a newspaper, to listen to a broadcast, and we will see horror, terror, evil in almost every corner of the world. Civil unrest, outright war. Not since really the Second World War as we may we see so much so much conflict uh, as we have nowadays. Things which are under the cover, things which may be hidden in our own country, for example, but we mentioned already the knife crimes that are going on and so many other things. In USA, shootings, it seems, almost every day. Ukraine, Russia, South American countries, the problems, for example, in Nicaragua, African countries, almost every one in some sort of turmoil, brought in very often from outside. What do the Muslim re leaders want to do with the Christians? And we in Britain, across the world, need someone who will give us and bring us peace. Who is listening to him? Will we listen? Will we yield to him? What is the message? And how do we hear it from the Lord? Did the people of Israel listen? No, the situation was just becoming worse. They had these judges giving us a hand, giving them a hand-to-hand -hand dealing of the disputes, but it didn't satisfy everyone. And they took the opportunity when Samuel grew old to ask for leaders like everybody else has got. We want kings. We want those who are strong. We want to be able to overcome. We want to be like them. Sometimes in our own lives, we look at other people and we think, if only, if only I was like that person, I'd have more money. I'd have no worries. I'd have things which I so much enjoy. Time, how much I'd like to be like them. They wanted kings like other countries had. And the request became more forceful when Samuel's sons, who naturally would be the successors when he died, well, they were no followers of God. We read, then all the people of Israel turned back to the Lord. So Samuel said to all the Israelites, if you'll return to the Lord with all your hearts, then rid yourselves of the foreign gods and the Asherites and commit yourself to the Lord and serve him only and he will deliver you out of the hands of the Philistines. So the Israelites put away their Baals and Asherahs and served the Lord only. Then Samuel said, Assemble all the Israel at his Mizpah, and I'll intercede with the Lord for you. When they had assembled there, they drew water and poured it out before the Lord. On that day they fasted, and there they confessed, We have sinned against the Lord. Now Samuel was serving as leader of Israel at Mizpah. Does that sound wonderful? The Philistines were subdued. 
They stopped invading Israel's territory. Throughout Samuel's lifetime, the hand of the Lord was against the Philistines. The towns from Macron to Gath, the Philistines had captured from Israel, were restored to Israel. And the Lord and Israel delivered the neighboring territories from the hand of the Philistines. And there was peace between Israel and the Amorites. And Samuel continued as Israel's leader all the days of his life. A year to year he went on circuit, judging Israel in all these places. And he built an altar to the, where his home was. Surely the Israelites will now give thanks to the Lord. Their traditional enemy had been defeated. Are the people praising God, giving thanks for victory? No, they thought they knew what was best. When Samuel grew old, he appointed his sons as Israel's leaders. The name of his firstborn was Joel, and the name of his second was Abjah, and they served at Beersheba. But, but, his sons didn't follow his ways. They turned aside after dishonest gain and accepted bribes and perverted justice. So all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel. They said to him, you're old and your sons do not follow your ways. Now point a king to lead us such as other nations have. But when they said, give us a king to lead us, his display pleased Samuel. So he prayed to the Lord, and the Lord told him, listen to all the people are saying to you. It's not you they've rejected, but they have rejected me as their king. And they have done from the day I brought them out of Egypt until this day, forsaking me and serving other gods. Now listen to them, but warn them solemnly and let them know what the king who reigns over them will claim as his rights. God had a leader for them, but they didn't want to hear. They had a profile in mind which was not God's choice. How like that is today. We want a strong leader. We want this sort of leader that sort of leader. But there is a name to whom we should all bow. At the name of Jesus, every knee should bow. Their appointed leader by God was now wearied and losing status. The normal replacements, sons of Solomon, we read, when Samuel grew old, he appointed his sons as Israel's leaders, but his sons did not follow his way. They turned aside after dishonest gain and accepted bribes and perverted justice. So once again, the, the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel, and they said to him, you're old, your sons do not follow your ways. Now appoint a king to lead us. But it wasn't Samuel's idea of a solution, and it certainly wasn't that of the Lord. When they said, give us a king to lead us, this displays, please Samuel. So he prayed to the Lord. And the Lord told him, listen to all the people are saying to you, it's not you they've rejected. They've rejected me as their king. And as they've done from the day I brought them out of Egypt until this day, forsaking me and serving other gods. How do our plans match up with God's? Do we define what we want and dismayed if God doesn't fit in with our plans? We want to the ability to understand God's ways and where we don't understand it, to yield to whatever he has for us. Things don't always go as we think 
they ought to go. That exam that the youngster has failed it. It was the illness which came on unexpectedly, but just at the top time, time when we needed it to be full, full strength, perhaps for a job interview or a celebration of a final family occasion. We thought we knew what was best. It doesn't really match up to what takes place. I'm happily married to Anne, my wife, and we're both, let's face it, well on years. I, I was married before to uh, Margaret, but she died of cancer. Anne was conscious when it came to thinking about our wedding. The plans were rather hurried. We're getting older, we'd better do something about it. And we finally agreed to go ahead. But uh, we'd been so slow that when we came to look at somewhere to uh, celebrate the wedding, to have the wedding breakfast, as they call it, that me meal that you have at night. The breakfast we have at night, yes. Well, we wanted a particular date in August that year. And uh, that date wasn't available in the places we went around to try and find where we could hold it. But there was one which was free, Friday the 13th. The superstitious people had kept away from it. Actually, we've just had a Friday the 13th, haven't we? We'd hoped for the 6th. Not for superstitious reasons, because it fitted into what our plans were for all those things which have to get, be, get done for a wedding. But in the end, because the uh, venue was free, we married on Friday the 13th. It wasn't uh, as, as, us to be superstitious. We've just had, as I say, that anniversary, which is also on the Friday the 13th. But how glad I am that we didn't hold out for the 31st of August 1997, because that day, there was a car crash in Paris and Princess Diana was killed. For those that didn't marry then, there were many who did and must have felt a shadow over that day. When we follow the history through from the book of Joshua, we find Israelites under pressure from the original Canaanite inhabitants. The Israelites had been led there by Moses and his leadership had passed on to Joshua. As we turn to the book of Judges, Joshua has now died. They were leader, leaderless, but with God, uh, jo, so Joshua's tribe taking the senior role. Seeking God's plans, they looked for guidance. The uh, First book, first sorry, the first chapter of Judges, and uh, the second verse. The Lord gave them an answer. They wanted to know who's going to fight against the Canaanites, and the Lord answered, Judah is to go. I've given him the land into his hands. There was a promise from God, but they had that leadership in Joshua's tribe. The death of the leader, Joshua, hadn't meant that God had withdrawn from them. Joshua might not be still there, but it seems that the arrangements, the organisation he left among the tribe allowed them to take the lead. They looked for support. 
In verse 3, they call upon the tribe of Simeon to walk with them. There's wisdom here. It could have been that they, the Joshua's leaders, could have said, we're the, we can do it all ourselves and take all the glory. How good it is to work with others with the same aim as ourselves. Looking to other like-minded churches to band together in the same evangelistic campaign or to encourage each other. Here the tribe of Judah called upon those of Simeon's tribe to work together. Solidarity, strength in numbers, encouragement. The first few verses of Judges seem to highlight the speed in which the army was brought together and the victory won. They caught one of the key figures from the enemy, one Adonai Bezek, and he was maimed by them to remove him from the battle. They cut off his big toe, they cut off his thumb, and it meant that he couldn't fire an arrow. He was not steady on his feet and he couldn't grasp the arrow and the uh, bowstring at the same time. But he recognised that he deserved what he had. He, he was a, one who had done some terrible things to his um, prisoners. There was a sacking of Jerusalem. How many times has Jerusalem been overwhelmed? The uh, importance of that city in the old in in the book of in the Bible. Over and over again, things happened there in Jerusalem. So, in the old books that uh, come in the archives of. Uh, libraries, very often the frontispiece is a map of the world and right in the centre is Jerusalem. Nowadays it's a, country, it's a land, it's a city which is in terrible trouble. It was a tough city even in those days to take in war. We read in Joshua, Judge Judah could not dislodge the Jebusites who were living in Jerusalem. To this day, the Jebusites live there with the people of Judah. Although the tribes of, Jew of Israel could trace their lineages back to Jacob, this didn't stop infighting between them. Ju Judah couldn't displace these Jebusites, but if he'd been working with other tribes, how different that might have been. How the power of Christ in the gospel going forth, if Christians were banded together in unity, how often do Christians just squabble among themselves? We need to be taking encouragement by each other to those who preach the truth in the gospel. Conquests of the land had been hard. God had given the land into their hands, but they had to fight for it. Judges 2 sees a change. We read of the death of Joshua. He'd been Moses' right-hand man and succeeded him. He held the tribes together. And we read, after that, the whole generation had been gathered to their ancestors. Another generation grew up who, neither, who knew neither the Lord nor what he'd done for Israel. Then the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord and served the Baals. They forsook the Lord, the God of their ancestors, who brought them out of Egypt. And they followed and worshipped various gods of the people around them. How easy it is to slip, to be those who worship not the true God, but a false God. 
It may be money. It may be power. It, it may be large force of uh, workers are under control. It may just be encouragement of our own egoism. Hear what the Lord said to them. The angel of the Lord went up from Gilgal to Bokim and said, I brought you out of Egypt and led you into the land I swore to give your ancestors. I said, I will never break my covenant with you. You shall not make covenant with the people of this land, but you shall break down their altars. God was merciful and gave them judges to protect, protect the nation. As followers of Christ, how far are we wandering from God's ways? We regularly need to seek the Lord's help. We need always to be on our guard. As we thought earlier, the judges weren't always the best. If the judges could not be trusted in reviving the nation, maybe having a king will. The wish was in the last verse of Judges 21. In those days, Israel had no king. Everyone did as they saw fit. And they thought a king would be better than a judge. Did they think it through? Was changing the title enough? What extra powers and what costs will a king bring? Too often the churches think that a bit of reorganisation will so solve the problems. It's God good to seek the Lord's guidance, but not change for change's sake. So let us hear what Samuel chapter 8 reads. When Samuel grew old, he appointed his sons as Israel's leaders. The name of his firstborn was Joel, the name of his second was Abjah, and they served at Beersheba. But his sons did not follow his ways. They turned aside after dishonest gain and accepted bribes and perverted justice. So the elders of Israel gathered together, came to Samuel. They said, you're old, your sons don't follow your ways. Now appoint a king to lead us, such as all the other nations have. I have a lot more that uh, I had planned to speak. We haven't got to the first king yet, but I think we will close what I'm saying here because we've got to look at ourselves. How devoted to God are we? Or do we just follow some pattern? It may be a good pattern, or it may be a bad pattern. Is it just that we can only look on the dark side? Our judges don't match what we want. We want a king. And if we're not careful, we get a king who doesn't match what we need. There is only one king, one saviour, one Lord, one God, one way. Is that, what, is that whom we're seeking? Is that in which we're giving our own lives over to? Our church's work over to? Our pattern of life under his sway? Or do we think that we know it all? I'm going to stop there. More could be said. Perhaps some other day we might say it.
but it is important that we know whom we serve. We know why we serve. We know how we serve. We may bring what is good, what is worthwhile to a saviour who leads us and guides us in this life. Great God of wonders, all thy ways are matchless, godlike and divine. We might put our name in there. So and so, all our ways are faulty. All the ways are earthbound. All our ways don't shine for God. But they can do if we take on board a Saviour who's done these great things for us. The fire glories of thy grace, more godlike and unrivaled shine. Who is a pardoning God? like thee or who has grace so rich and free that's the God we should serve not the putty medals that this world can offer but let us serve a wonderful God a wonderful saviour Great God of wonders, all thy ways are matchless, godlike and divine.